Hello, everybody watching Amazonas right now. We've got another fun interview coming up for you, this time with Lily. Hi, Lily. How are you? Hi, I'm doing really well. Thanks cool. for interviewing me. <laughs> Absolutely. So we met you, um, the whole Amazonas team, at Triple Crown. What was that in Kentucky a month ago, two months ago? Yeah, something like that. And your booth was so cool, and you have such neat stuff, and your project is amazing, so I'm not going to do it any justice. Why don't you tell everybody what you do? Yeah, that sounds perfect. Um, so I'm Lily. I'm 21, and I am a university senior at Minerva University. Uh, right now, I'm located in Buenos Aires, Argentina, as part of my study abroad program, and I'll be here for the rest of this semester. Um, when I went to Louisville, it was to share about my project, uh, which is the conservation of freshwater fish species. So every senior at my school has to write a senior capstone, which is like a thesis uh, before undergraduates. And I decided to make mine about freshwater conservation long before that I knew I was going to be writing this capstone. Um, so basically what I did was I wanted to make a warehouse just for myself where I could breed and research endangered species because I'm pretty sure at least every hobbyist has thought about doing that at least <laughs> once. Um, and I was really determined to make it happen. So I started interviewing people, um, you know, people in charge of CITES, legislation, permits, things like that. And one of the main questions that they asked me was how I was going to keep track of this information. Um, and I said I had set up a little database on this note-taking app called Notion. Um, I was going to you know, keep track of it there. And it would be publicly available. So anyone who wanted to look through it and read through whatever information I had could. And in every interview that I had, they all said, we are more interested in the database. Mm -hmm. um, that, has a lot of, <laughs> that has a lot of possibility. Yeah. Um, so I focused, I started to focus more on the database and as I was reaching out to more people in the field, whether it be zoos and aquariums, fisheries and hatcheries, conservation organizations, things like that, I started to get a little bit more of an image of what that looks like right now, what the information transfer between groups looks like. And it's not great, to be honest. I think that um, the information transfer between all the conservation groups and the hobbyists especially has not really been modernized um, mm -hmm. in the sense that hobbyists, for example, will still take down a lot of notes in journals um, and in physical journals or post in Facebook groups, things that are very easy to lose. Um, and being a hobbyist and being in several different hobbyist Facebook groups, I it just made me sad to know that all of the information was disappearing and then people would have to start over at square one. So every time, instead of being able to progress more easily, they'd have to start over with the experimentation and finding out, you know, how can I spawn these fish? Right. So that's what led to the creation of the database. And I'll give you guys a little tour. There are still some things wrong with it because I am on a college student budget. Um, <laughs> so I funded, <laughs> I funded the whole project myself um, through various jobs and whatnot um, hmm. and hired with the people that were within my price range to create the database. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have enough to make sure it was like, perfect um but it is functional um and if you can go ahead and enable screen sharing i can take you guys absolutely. through absolutely there you go should be good okay uh can you see this all right can yep Looks wonderful good. so this is what we have so far um and you'll see that it's just a bunch of different families here mm -hmm. and this is for freshwater species um so you will see that there are some amphibians and invertebrates here as well so if you click on one of these, you can see just this picture, the status, a written description, a scientific name and common name, and some quick stats about the care and everything like that. So, you know, the family, the size, the tank size that you would need, diet, temperament, um, everything that you would need to just keep it in an aquarium, right? And then you also have this map. Um, when you pop it out, it shows you where this fish is from. Um, so this is a very loose um, map, of course, but eventually we hope that it'll have pins in the areas that it's been collected. Um, nice. Nothing too specific to avoid people going there and collecting for themselves. But uh, let's see, once you log in, you have access to a lot more. So that's even without creating an account. You can still view all of this information. However, once you go and actually log in and view the same species, you can add your own images, and then your username automatically gets put on the image for credit. Um, you can add and view conservation efforts. So if it's an endangered species, 
any group or individual working with this will then also be put on this map. Um, so obviously no specific locations. Again, we don't want people showing up at your door and being like, hey, you have X rare species. I also <laughs> want X rare species. Um, but just to give a better idea of how many individuals are working with it. So if it's a critically endangered species and there are three people working with it, that's an indication that we need to get more people on board. It needs to be mm -hmm. spread across other institutions, other groups um, to kind of ensure the longevity of that species. You can also look at research papers. So a lot of cichlids have had research done on them uh, for various things like group behavior, dominance, um, parenting styles. You can view all of that here. And it's not so this is free to create an account. So it, the research papers are no longer stuck behind a paywall. And like a lot of the researchers that I've talked to get very frustrated that their article, their work has only been published in one or two places and you mm -hmm. need to pay um, or you need to have access through a university or an institution in order to even read the research that they work so hard on. Yeah. Um, you can also add new setups and see the current setup reports. So if I'm keeping this fish, um, I'm from Colorado in the States, it's not going to be the same at all as if I were keeping this fish in a completely different country or even just a different state. Coming out of the tap, the water is different. Um, the things in the water, the seasonal temperatures. So everyone has varying success with these species. So one thing I wanted to address is that a lot of these guides only have one range. They say, okay, this is the temperature range. You should keep your fish. And then you have to fiddle with it and say, does it prefer it slightly warmer, slightly cooler? Uh, does it depend on the area that I live? So when you click on the setup reports, and these will be displayed in a much more legible way uh, soon, um, <laughs> but you can see all of the information that other people have uploaded about a species, and you can see how other people have kept it. Wow. Um, and it's the same thing for breeding information. So you can see all the breeding reports of people who have bred this species and see how they successfully got the species to spawn. Um, and so there are a lot of different species. Most of these have been added by me, um, but I am running a contest right now and whoever submits the most entries mm -hmm. will get a set of six pins, which I will show soon. Um, but as you can <laughs> see, some of these were uploaded by other users and they have absolutely gorgeous pictures. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's well, been something nice. I've been yep. really lucky to, <laughs> to have contributed here. Cool. Um, and then there are just like some other features that I'm still fiddling with like the blog posts and the forums. Um, so that has like a general summary of the project. So for anyone who wants to know more about the history, um, they can go here. There's a species identification thread. So if you're unsure what species you have, um, I don't know if you've ever been in a Facebook group where somebody incorrectly identified a species, but that oh, yeah. gets corrected so fast. Yes. <laughs> <They're> like, hmm, <laughs> that's actually the wrong species. Do you not know anything? Like obviously people <laughs> could be a bit mean, People can be a bit mean, I will say that, but the misinformation yep. is corrected really, really quickly. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> so there's all sorts of stuff there. And one of the cooler features is if you have a species that was imported and you know who collected it, where it was from and what it is, you can actually register it. So just like you would a purebred dog, um, you can register a species and if it's wild caught, then you have the collection location, the seller, and the date acquired, and you'll get this certificate. And that allows you, so when you eventually, hopefully, breed a species, um, you'll see that you can also register for captive bred. Mm -hmm. So this is when you have wild caught individuals that have spawned and you want to register the, the offspring. And then eventually, if you sell or redistribute the offspring at all, people can use that number to track all the way back to the origin, right? Where these fish came from. Um, and that way you can also see how much genetic diversity has been added. If, you know, wild um, fish have, you know, been reintroduced into the population. And eventually I hope that will be used for different conservation efforts if we ever get to reintroduction and everything. Right. Um, so there are lots more features that I want to include in this database, all dependent on how much I can pay people to do it. Um, but. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's the biggest so, issue. <laughs> yeah. This this is the biggest part of my project, um, but for my capstone, I will be writing a literature review on conservation through consumption. So looking at different ways that we can use this database, but also aquaculture um, mm -hmm. in order to help save species. So a lot of species um, are either consumed to eat or consumed to sell to hobbyists. Mm -hmm. And 
that has to be done sustainably. At this point, it's not feasible to say you can't do that anymore um, because it's a huge part of local economies and it's a huge part of the hobby and things like that. So instead of trying to ban these sorts of actions, instead looking at ways to make it more sustainable and try and alleviate that pressure on natural environments um, is what I'm going to be writing about. Um, so that's very exciting as well. That is exciting. I'm assuming <laughs> at some point when this is written, it will also be on the website so that other people can read it, which would be great. <laughs> yes, it will. Um... Very good. <laughs> cool. Well, this, I mean, this is a really ambitious project. How long have you been working on this? Um, I think I'm getting close to a thousand hours, um, but I've been working on this project over the last couple of years. Okay. I've been a hobbyist since middle school, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and it, that's been a while. And then the idea of the warehouse has been around basically since then. Um, and then, you know, this project, I most recently started working on it throughout college, um, mm -hmm. university. So neat. Yes. Yeah. Tell me more about this ultimate warehouse goal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started with all of the calculations and everything, but I would love to do a warehouse that mimics fish natural habitats as much as possible. So integrating it a lot with technology and using things like timers and smart lights and things like that. And what I would do is mimic the natural cycles. So based off of the current weather in wherever they're from, kind of use that to mimic how much water, how much water is being overturned in the tank. Um, wow. So how much new water they're getting, the temperature of that water, um, light cycles, things like that, in order to kind of try and mimic the natural habitat to, you know, view natural behaviors, even if it is in captivity. Sure. And in order to track all the species, um, I was thinking, are you familiar with Patreon? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah. Um, so I was thinking of employing a Patreon-like structure where yeah. people could subscribe, but I'd have um, almost like security cameras on the tanks or in the tanks. I was also looking at In the options. tanks, definitely um, <laughs> in the tanks. <laughs> um, and the reason being is that if people support this, then they can go and view the footage and see and help me do the observations on right. what the fish are doing because if I get anywhere past three tanks it'll be really difficult to monitor all of the spawning behavior go through yeah. all of the security footage and like look for the clips that are most important um, so having people be able to pick a species they want access to for example and say I want to watch Syphotilapia frontosa <laughs> and you know if I'm busy doing some research on another species and they spawn they can submit a report and say these fish exhibited spawning behaviors at 16 hours and 10 minutes into this video. Yeah. Um, and then it's, it's very community driven. That's something is, I realized very early on that I couldn't do it as an individual effort. Right. Um, and I, I think that's one of the biggest pitfalls right now of all of the databases is it's like one person, one very dedicated, <laughs> wonderful, motivated person or group <laughs> of motivated individuals trying to keep up on all of this information when it's pretty much impossible. Yep. And since everyone has their own little hubs um, to put this information, then a lot of times research gets duplicated or um, one person I interviewed said that they had done a survey of a specific watershed. And then like a month later, another group had done a survey of that exact same watershed oh, because no. it was necessary. Yeah, Like that watershed needed to be surveyed, but yep. there was no communication between the two or central hub to say like, this is what we're doing. Um, right. So the same one got surveyed twice, whereas that funding could have been used elsewhere. Right. Um, so really tackling that communication gap um, is something I've been hoping for. And then obviously the warehouse would fulfill my dream. Um, I've also been looking <laughs> at different ways to combine it with like hydroponics. Yeah. Um, so looking to grow food um, specifically. Um, I've looked a lot at mushrooms. Um, that's something that's becoming more common is to grow mushrooms in yeah. hydroponic systems. Mm -hmm. um, also house plants. Um, those have gotten a lot of popularity during the pandemic and the recent years. And yeah, it's true. I've always loved plants. Um, so growing them in a hydroponic system not only would help balance the water, but, you know, could also provide an additional source of income. Sure. That was always my dad's biggest worry is how are you going to support yourself? Like, how are you going to live? Right. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, valid concern, but yeah. It house is. House plants to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's great. Um, so currently, um, how many species do you have on the website? 
Um, on the website right now, I have 46 species, I believe. Cool. Um, and a lot of them have been inputted by me. So right. they're, whatever I go to, when I was at the Triple Crown Convention, for example, and they people had all of their show fish, I was like, this is a perfect example of this species. Yeah. Um, so I went and took a bunch of pictures and I'm slowly working my way through uploading them all because you know at the show they were very clearly labeled, this is the species, it's yep. a male. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so having that information is really valuable. Um, sure. I have also gotten a lot of groups that say, we don't have time to do it, but you're free to use our pictures. Um, so I've been working okay. through that as well. Um, so that, I mean, that is an option. Obviously I would prefer if hobbyists and groups like did use the website to upload their own information, how they keep right. the species. But I also understand that like everyone is crazy busy pretty much all the time. And that just seems to be a trend. Um, <laughs> so I've been using the pictures and then putting the written like credit in the description. Nice. Um, so that's been a good way to get some of the rarer species as well. Um, nice yeah on both instagram and facebook and i'm slowly working towards building youtube but i'm not much of a video editor so i just post the videos as i take them which is like you it know works. they're not the most <laughs> en engaging or entertaining there's not like the overlays and the cut uh cut twos and the right all the cool fancy youtube stuff but you know i talk at the camera and <laughs> i mean that's a good start <laughs> yeah Cool. Yeah. We, I actually just started following your YouTube channel right before this. I was like, oh, I have to go check this out. <laughs> so yes, people well, go follow you. the YouTube channel. And um, if people want to get involved, so I'll put a link um, when, when I put the video up of, of where they can check this out. Um, but mm -hmm. they can just very easily create an account like you showed us in that little tutorial and start uploading fish. So if anyone watching yeah. wants to do that, <laughs> needs something fun to do with their fish pictures over the weekend, that would be a yeah. Good thing and to I do. mean, the contest for the pins doesn't close until October. Oh, so at, <laughs> so yes, the pins. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I knew um, it's difficult to get donations, especially when you don't have something tangible. Um, it's yeah. just human psychology. It's not like people are bad people. Um, you just <laughs> people like having something to show for what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so I created these enamel pins. I randomly messaged a bunch of artists on Instagram and I was like, hey, do you want to help me with my project? And only one of them replied. <laughs> and since then, we've had an amazing partnership. And How cool. she designs these pins and I have them made. So the first three that I had made were these three. So here you have the little Denison barb. Mm -hmm. here you have cyanodorsalis, so blue-eyed yeah. rainbow fish. And the last one is the licorice grommy. Yes. And the thing that these three have in common is that they're all fairly common and popular species in the hobby, but they're all endangered in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things, they usually come from, you know, far, like fish farms, and whether it be Florida or Indonesia. Right. Um, and most hobbyists have seen these and a lot of obvious have hobbyists have owned these, um, but there isn't enough attention like saltwater fish get. And so my hopes in that making these cute little pins is that people can wear them and kind of share the information that they know, as well as being a way to financially support the project. Yeah. Um, and when I went to Louisville, um, I made three more. Um, cause the three big groups there were the cichlid association, the Tilly fish, fish association and the live bears association. Um, so I made, so the, you had those up. made just in time for Louisville. All right. Yes, I did. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, that was nice. Little sail fin Molly. Oh, cool. And then this killifish right awesome. here. Yeah. So those are the six designs. And then actually from the triple crown convention, a couple of clubs reached out to me and asked if I could do like custom designs oh, for yeah. their clubs or their conventions. So that's another way that like a whole or like whole groups have been supporting my project. That's nice. Um, so I commissioned two other different types of rainbow fish uh, from Ooh. my artist and then had them made into pins and shipped to these clubs for their convention. Um, so just kind of like a small way to to support the project and also kind of get the word out. Yeah. Um, so that's been really helpful. <laughs> that's very smart. I like this idea. I would, as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, we have stuff. We should do this too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we did this really nice Kerrison special last year. Um, it was like our seventh special uh, issue of the year. Normally we do six and it was a seventh for mm -hmm. last year. And it was all uh, new Brazilian Kerrisons. And uh, we have some very cool Tetras on the cover. and. 
I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we need some Tetras. <laughs> I think everybody needs some Tetras. That's one Definitely. thing I still have to do here is find like the equivalent of the local fish store. Oh, I, I do that in every country that I go to, um, but I haven't done it here yet. So, <laughs> Well, you just got, so you're in Argentina right now. So you just moved. You just got there like a week ago, mm -hmm. right? We arrived September 2nd. So it's oh been my two goodness. weeks almost. Yeah. Um, but yeah, between classes and, you know, the fact that our kitchen is empty and you can't really bring much food across the border or anything you have to oh, go no. out and find the food and thankfully I do have like a decent grasp of Spanish um, but a lot of my classmates don't That's so good. I've been helping them you know find places to to eat and to <laughs> live <laughs> Oh yeah, that's uh, that's quite the project on its own. <laughs> so you said you'll be there for the semester, and then right. yeah, and then one more semester and you're done. And then what? What's happening when once you're done with college? <laughs> so I am hoping to turn this into a nonprofit organization yeah. over the course of the next year, uh, and Great. I do have some support from the interviews that I've done and things like that. And then hopefully I'll be able to work on this full time. Um, what I was always telling people jokingly about the warehouse is that normally when people think about it, they have a very stable job and like a very nice career. And so it's difficult to kind of take that plunge into the unknown. But I've never had a stable job or nice career. So I feel like I'm in a perfect position to just kind of throw myself into it and see what happens. There's and... nothing to compare it to. So it'll be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um... <laughs> That's so fun. definitely planning on working on that. Um, I do want to do something fish related if that you know, and doesn't yeah. end up working out. Um, but I, I have a good feeling about it. So <laughs> good. I do too. I mean, it sounds amazing. Um, and it, it, you're certainly off to a great start. I mean, this is, you've accomplished a lot in not a very long period of time, which is super impressive. And I'm very glad you're doing it. Um, so yeah, we would definitely encourage people to try to get involved in any way they can buy pins. If they want to get pins, they can contact you directly, right? That's the best current way to get right. pins. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be through email, Facebook, Instagram. I kind of unhealthily check all of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all do. <laughs> yeah. So that's fun. Well, yeah, they should definitely, definitely get those. I need to get more of them. I only have one. I got my uh, uh, <laughs> Paris for Menace one at, at the show and I love it. I've gotten many compliments on it. It's got a nice spot on the backpack, so it's good. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing I like about pins is they're so versatile. Like I saw people they put are. them on hats, backpacks, shoes, um, lanyards for the convention. Yeah. Shoes. Yeah. The one <laughs> scales. Um, yeah. <laughs> Gail's art. His art is amazing. And he put the pin yeah. on his Crocs. Um, so I thought, I thought what a good idea. I, I never thought good. to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's great. Very cool. Well, this is exciting stuff. And I'm glad we got to chat about this. And I hope everyone watching will go check it out and try to get involved where they can, because there are certainly a lot of people out there who breed freshwater fish, especially ones that, you know, are, are more on the endangered side. And that's really what we need to be doing. And just raise awareness and keep track of everything everyone's doing. It's amazing to have a database for that. So yeah, thanks for doing that. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. For sure. And we'll keep in contact and let us know how things progress and, uh, you know, what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. All right. Great. Well, thanks and good luck with everything. <laughs> thank you so much.